Good morning, Emmanuel Church. I'm so sorry not to be able to be with you in person, and uh, God willing, I'm certainly hoping to be with you in September, and I'm hoping that the big 40th anniversary celebrations will be able to go ahead. I, I can hardly believe it's been 40 years. Unbelievable, but God has been faithful, and he continues to be. So I'm speaking to you this morning from the uh, church uh, that we're based in here in Stratford, Jubilee Christian Fellowship, and uh, they've kindly allowed me to use their premises for this recording. I want to speak to you this morning, uh, and I'll give a slight background to the title before I even give the title out. When I was a student at the University of Toronto, uh, from time to time I used to go and attend evening services at the Avenue Road Church. And it was a church that had a very special presence of God in it. Uh, it had been the church that just shortly before that, Dr. A.W. Tozer had pastored until he died. And uh, I didn't know who A.W. Tozer was, and maybe some of you uh, that are listening to me now don't know who he was. Uh, but he was an extraordinary man of God. And one of the uh, things that he's noted for is he left behind uh, not only a whole load of teaching, but a treasury of incredible quotations. And I want to speak to you this morning on one of them that you may have seen on social media or on the internet in these past weeks. And it's this, Tozer said, a frightened world needs a fearless church. The history of the Christian church has exemplified that saying. Let me just take a couple minutes to give you some historical examples. Between 250 and 270 AD, a terrible plague, believed to be measles or smallpox, devastated the Roman Empire. At the height of the plague, 5,000 people were dying every day in Rome alone. The emperor blamed Christians for it, but that claim was undermined by two inconvenient facts, that Christians were dying as well as everybody else, and also that unlike everybody else, Christians were caring for the victims, including their pagan neighbors. And that wasn't a new phenomenon in Rome because Christians had done the same thing a hundred years earlier during the Antonine Plague, they stayed in the afflicted cities when the pagan leaders and doctors all fled. A historian wrote, by their actions in the face of possible death, Christians showed their neighbors that Christianity is worth dying for. Listen to the words of Charles Spurgeon in the middle of a great cholera epidemic in London. And he said this, all day and sometimes all night long, I went about from house to house and saw men and women dying, and how glad they were to see my face, when many were afraid to enter their houses, lest they should catch the deadly disease. We who had no fear about such things found ourselves most gladly listened to when we spoke of Christ. And Spurgeon led many of those dying people into an eternal heaven. And now this news report recently has come in from China, and I'll just uh, quote some of it. In contrast with the chaos that the city of Wuhan saw in the early days of the outbreak as the coronavirus paralyzed the government, churches were busy delivering masks and protective gear accurately and efficiently. As many uh, of those N95 masks were siphoned off by corrupt local officials. One church managed to deliver 400 of them, 1,000 gloves, and 1,000 protective goggles to the central hospital. Most of those donations had been sent by overseas believers. An additional 30,000 masks were handed out on the street by members of the team in the first week of the quarantine, along with gospel passages uh, attached to them. And besides churches and street preachers, many individual Christians in Wuhan were busy assisting the sick. Christians in Wuhan are living proof of the best qualities of humanity, offering us a glimmer of hope in this world full of suffering uh, and fear. Their composure and efficiency, as well as their love and strength, 
stem from their faith. Amazing, isn't it? The book of Hebrews makes this statement, "'Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, that is, partook likewise of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. A frightened world needs a fearless church. These verses in Hebrews reveal Jesus marching forth to destroy his greatest enemy. That enemy, of course, is the devil, and the most powerful weapon of the devil is fear. Now, none of us should be uh, ashamed of admitting that we battle against fear. Fighting fear is fighting Satan, and there's nothing to be ashamed of in admitting that we're fighting Satan. Fear is a killer. It eats up all of our energy and incapacitates us. It takes God out of the equation by making us believe that we're alone and there's no one to help us. It causes us to make stupid, irrational, and impulsive decisions to defend ourselves, which in the end often do more damage than the original problem. And when we look back on how we've all handled this current crisis, uh, there may be more than a modicum of truth uh, to that uh, applied to ourselves, our governments, and so on. Now, in any event, we shouldn't be ashamed to admit that we're afraid. It's normal and natural and unavoidable to be confronted by fear. But we can always choose to take our fears to God. Now, what this scripture in Hebrews 2 reveals to us is that all of the fears we face in our lives are rooted and grounded in one basic fear, which is the fear of death. At our desperate and most fearful moments, when our heart, what our heart cries out is this, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to be abandoned? And God answers that question for us actually answers it in lots of places in the Bible, but none better than in one of my favorite passages at the end of Romans chapter 8, where Paul writes, no, in all these things, not, he says, in all these things. Christians can't be expected to be delivered in such a way that we will never face trouble, but God says, in the trouble, I'll meet you. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. God sent Jesus to die on our behalf. He sent Jesus to take our punishment on his shoulders. He sent Jesus in order that we would never be separated from him or from his love. Physical death is nothing more than the doorway to eternal glory. The battle we face and fight every day against fear has already been won. Every fear you ever have faced or will have to face has been defeated at the cross. And the first step to winning this battle is to ask God to send His Holy Spirit into your heart. And to send Him into your heart, because you can't win the battle on your own and God doesn't expect you to, but asking God to send His Spirit into your heart to help you focus on two things. First, that the ultimate battle is truly won. The first thing we need to focus on. And second, that Jesus, by his Spirit, is there with us every day to help face any and every fear we may have. Is it possible that we'll face financial or health or relationship or job challenges in life? Is it possible that we'll become sick? Of course it is. We live in a fallen world with fallen people like us, around us. But we will always be protected spiritually. And just as it was with the Israelites 
who endured the plagues of Egypt yet had protection from the very worst, God promises to help us in the midst of all these challenges, including the ones that we're facing in these days. We may get sick, yet God is our healer. Finances may run short, yet God is our provider. We may lose a job or a friendship. We may suffer marriage or family stress, but God is our restorer. We may feel alone, but the Lord is our shepherd. Even if we face death, Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and we will live with him forever. As a friend of mine said, if you hear that I've died, don't believe it. I've only changed my place of residence. So the bottom line is that whatever happens, he promises us that he will not abandon us. The bottom line, again, is this. Your life is not in the hands of people or of circumstances. It's in the hands of God. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hebrews chapter 13, those well-known verses. Now to be free from anxiety about tomorrow means we need the Holy Spirit to meet us today. And the Holy Spirit meets us by giving us the antidote to anxiety, which is faith. Faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. What is faith? Faith is the confidence that God will act on your behalf. Faith is far more than just things that you think or things that you feel. It's way more than that. Faith is a gift of God. You don't have to work it up. All you have to do is ask for it. And faith is the confidence above everything else that God will act on your behalf. You can't think yourself into faith. You can't feel yourself in, into faith. But you can ask for faith and it will be given to you by the Holy Spirit. Faith gives you peace in your heart that God will act on your behalf today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and the day after that. It delivers you from fear by filling the vacuum that fear lives in. So the battle against fear is real. Most of us live in it every day, and there's no shame in admitting that. But let's remember that Jesus won that battle at the cross, and he's waiting to apply it to our life today, and he wants it to be not just enough of a victory to help us, but he wants that victory to overflow because a frightened world needs a fearless church. Last November, we left Stratford here on our way to Michigan to spend some time with the churches there. And when we started off, everything was fine. It was cold, but the skies were bright blue. Uh, about 45 minutes into our journey, some clouds appeared, then a few snowflakes. And pretty soon, you could hardly see where you were going. We found ourselves behind a big lorry, and we hung in for the duration. About a half hour or so later, skies cleared, the sun came out, and wouldn't you know it, there wasn't even a flake of snow on the ground. And that's how it goes in the Ontario snow belt. Now, I wasn't too bo bothered because I had checked the radar in advance, and I could see what we call a streamer coming in right off of the lake, and from the map and the projection of time, I knew pretty well where it started and where it would end. Now, I didn't tell Elaine the streamer was going to even be there because, well, she might not have come with me. But you know what? Life is a lot like that. Things start off fine, but then a cloud appears on the horizon. And pretty soon, it develops into a storm, sometimes a pretty big one. And like you, we've been in a few of them. At the time, you don't really know when it's going to end and how you're going to get out of it. But that's when we need to learn to look at the radar. The radar tells us that Jesus Christ is Lord over everything. The radar tells us that Jesus has conquered fear because he's destroyed the creator of fear. 
Yes, tribulation will come, and we shouldn't be surprised because we're in a battle. But we have the promise that nothing in heaven or earth will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's that perfect love that casts out fear. And the good thing is, whether it was us driving that day, or whether it's you and I navigating our way through these strange days in which we're living, the good thing is that if we know tribulation is coming, we also know it's ending. Like that streamer coming off the lake, it won't last forever. What the radar really shows is that God is in charge of it all. So when a streamer comes off the lake and hits you personally, or the whole world around you, be assured that you will come out the other end of it just like we did. And if you're a believer, you will get to your destination. God guarantees it. And if you doubt me, read the end of the book. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that you are the Alpha, the Omega. You are the Lord of the beginning. You are the Lord of the end. You are the Lord of everything in between. You are the Lord of our lives personally, of our finances, of our health, of our family, of our church. You're the Lord over this entire world. You created it. And we thank you today that we can come to you in confidence. In those moments when we experience fear, we can come to you because you have the cure. You have the antidote. You have the vaccine. You have it all. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray as we come to you today, and each of us in our own way carrying our own burdens, that we might find you by the presence of your Spirit. And I thank you, Father, that faith isn't something that I have to create, but it's something that you give when I ask for it. And may that faith come to each of us who's listening today, along with your precious presence. In Jesus' name, amen.